Let's talk about why therapy hasn't worked for you. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Julia Cha, success coach for change makers and change leaders. Today I got a very important topic because I hear this a lot. And also it's something that I have a very deep personal experience in. And that is why therapy, even coaching, and I'm even including alternative methods like energy healing or hypnosis and why they haven't worked for you. Why hasn't that completely transformed, shifted and radically been the magic wand, the lottery to change your life? Well, let me start this conversation uh, with a disclaimer. I am not here to throw anyone under the bus. I believe all modalities have a time and place. I've been in the journey of healing for a very, very long time way before I started doing this kind of work. And I didn't feel ready to do this kind of work until I repaired a lot of my issues that are adult issues, but I had the awareness that they were from childhood issues. So if you are someone who is obviously aware that you have things that you want to change, whether you're having really a really difficult time sleeping or achieving goals or you're procrastinating or you're not moving toward the direction that you really want to go you keep being held back from your potential or the direction that you want to move towards or you have a really difficult time parenting you have a really hard time with relationships or you have anger issues or you've been depressed or you've been really anxious you're getting you have panic attacks or you have OCD or you have addictions whatever it is it really doesn't matter because what I can tell you is what we perceive as present issues or adult issues, they can be traced back and be rooted in childhood issues. If you've been doing self-development for a long time, if you've been doing a lot of healing for a long time, you already know this, but I felt very much compelled to repeat this because of what I'm about to describe and help you understand how you can make your therapy, healing, uh, ascension, coaching actually to work and to give you the results. To share very briefly about the level of trauma I experienced, I score a 10 out of 10 on the ACE test. That is the Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire. If you want to look at it, I'll put a link down below in the description. But 10 out of 10 is severe, it's really high. To um, just give you some examples, and I should say trigger warning before you start hearing my story. Um, first of all, there's some less, uh, cr um, less abrasive stuff. Like, you know, some things are very hard to listen to. Some things is just, it seems like normal part of life. Uh, like immigration, I immigrated twice before the age of 11. So immigration is a type of trauma that is often not discussed because people see that as like, oh, you know, you're going, you're, um, re you are make a transition, your family is making a transition towards a better life. It sounds simple until you experience it. Immigration is actually quite traumatic because you are pulled out from culture that you know of, that all of your familiarity and also the family that you grew up with and familiar environment and being displaced. So what happened was I, uh, we moved to Argentina when I was five and I actually, actually died back. My mother died first. So that was extremely traumatic. I was four years old and then we moved to Argentina. So and we moved from Korea to Argentina. You can see a massive cultural language, just like everything different. And also I started to live with my dad who I didn't know. And my dad already had a new wife. So um, that's one level of trauma. And then we repeated it again, the immigration process when we came to Canada when I was 11 years old. Again, brand new language, brand new culture, new way of doing. Socialization becomes really difficult when you move like that. So immigration is huge trauma, I experienced it twice under the age of 11, plus my mother died when I was four, and then there was a lot of violence because my dad, um, when I look at him, although I'm not in the position to diagnose people, he likely was a psychopath. He was very violent, he was an alcoholic, I probably had sex addiction because he had so many wives, and he was always cheating on them, and even when I was very young, I knew he was. And um, financially, because of his mental state, we had a lot of topsy-turvy ups and downs. And um, 
I just wanted my extended family to save me. And I had some really lovely extended family members who were just so loving. And if I didn't have them, even my cousins, and uh, after we moved, we didn't see them frequently, but for a while we were, I was being sent back every summer-ish, every year. And I feel like when I look back, that's what saved me. And also I had two dogs and I feel like they really saved me because you know, that animal connection with your pet is extremely soothing. And those of you who have pets, you understand this. And there were several saving graces um, in the midst of trauma. It has so much trauma. There's violence. Um, I had bruises all over my body all the time. Um, my stepmother, she cracked my head. And she cracked my skull when I was eight years old. So lots of things, lots of things, um, you know, verbal abuse. And then because I was an unprotected female, as well from very early when i was 16 years old we were already in canada and you know i just have so so many trauma events like it's like back to back to back so it might be confusing but what happens that we were in canada and my dad had a brand new set of wife um and her and another family um different from the one i grew up with in argentina so it was like a lot of displacement and confusion um but anyway my dad decided to go back to korea and you know some of you if you're asian you know, Asian parents sometimes do that. It's quite common in North America. They just like go back to where their original country to work and they send you money and you're the kid, you're a teenager, you're supposed to take care of yourself. So that's actually trauma. I know lots of um, some of my Asian friends and um, clients have had, they've had something very similar where parents, they think that you're all grown up because you are now an official teen. So they just kind of like send you off and you're a kid not knowing what to do. So. What happened was around at 16 years old, um, my brother and I were both minors, still attending high school. My dad just left, and you know he gave us warning, but like, what do you do, right? <laughs> it's like I'm leaving, um, and then he didn't provide for us. So that abandonment, neglect just became much worse. So um, I don't remember how we survived the, the two years in high school. Uh, for me, it was grade 11, and 12. Uh, partly because he was gone and he had a lot of issues. I performed better in school. So I started to get all A's and B's, whereas before that, years before that, I was struggling. Um, but the problem was financial support because you need it as a kid. And also I was never prepared on how do you, know, how do you earn money? Like I could cook and do all those things, uh, pay bills, but just didn't have the resources, didn't know how to get the resources. So. Um, I felt like the trauma really, like it was like a lifetime of trauma and then just like huge trauma there. Trying to survive constantly, um, trying to you know not fall into bad things and I'm proud to say I never did drugs and things like that. Um, my group of friends were always very smart people who were very focused in school. So um, part of it is that I had that so I felt like I was sheltered from really going down the wrong going down the wrong path so without going into too much detail that's basically the trigger warning that ends there so maybe one day i will share the story with you guys if you guys want to know more but i just want to stick to the point i started seeking therapy at 18 when i entered university and university insurance started to cover it and i went to therapy all the time like every week but i wasn't progressing when i left university uh, i went to therapy consistently i wasn't progressing i felt like there was just something in my head i didn't know how to like unload and cleanse that was kind of the fe feeling that i was looking for just i wanted to not be bogged down by the past memories or resentment and the fear the sadness and I wanted to have a tangibly good outcome. I wanted to have good friends. I wanted to have a healthy circle. Um, I knew that I didn't have very strong, um, it wasn't very easy for me to maintain new friendships. The friendships from high school were easier to maintain, but the new friendships as an adult, it was very difficult. Um, and also ongoing family drama relationship with siblings all of those things were extremely challenging and when dating started happening i i saw a lot of challenge there i felt like i wanted to change these things and just couldn't oh the other aspect was that i really wanted to get my career going 
after school finished and I just didn't know what to do. The lack of direction, uh, believe it or not, that lack of direction and not knowing what you want, that comes from not really knowing who you are and that's actually a trauma symptom. I wasn't aware of that. So if you have that, then, you know, when you don't know what your life purpose is or when you don't know what you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to be, and as a fully grown adult, and this is like haunting you, that's a very old trauma symptom. You know, I was going like six, seven years to therapy and not really getting results. And one, on one side, I was going to therapy. The other side, I was seeing that my life was completely, it was becoming a massive train wreck on the other side. Um, I am not blaming my therapist here because I know a lot of people go to therapy consistently and don't get results. What I want to bring to light here is uh, from the position of where I am now. I'm someone who's got real results, okay? It's not perfect. Uh, it's definitely not the ultimate where I want to be, but you know, that doesn't really exist as long as you're alive because as humans, we have greater aspirations at all times, but I've come an extremely, extremely, extremely long way. And when I look around in my current life, I am very satisfied with what I created considering where I started. So, um, you know, when it comes to finances, you know, I really believe in my ability to earn and to keep and to grow. Uh, I believe in my ability to, to create an outcome that I, that I picture and to have patience to work towards. Uh, I am a very good parent. I'm very aware and conscious and I am very receptive to further help. I, you know, consistently still seek help and get help regularly. Uh, which is one of, the, one of the points I want to review in a bit when it comes to, you know, making therapy work. Um, and um, I feel like I have really, really, I have created amazing results considering where I started from and the level of trauma that I experienced. My awakening truly began about nine years ago when I became a single mom, when I left that relationship because it was really toxic and dysfunctional. Um, so this is the thing, it's like I was going to therapy and I was making the efforts, but at the same time, my life was becoming more and more of a train wreck. <laughs> Some people go to stand still. At the time, I, I was like, wow, this is like, and it's like, you, you kind of know you, you're on it, but it's like an elevator, right? So you're in it, so you know you're moving, you know you're kind of going downwards. Sometimes it feels like you're going up, but you can't tell which way, like in an elevator, sometimes you can't tell where you're going. And before you know it, it's like, I hit my rock bottom. So <laughs> without boring you too much, that's the nutshell of, of my experience. Uh, and um, now nine years later, why I'm making this video is because so many of you are probably feeling jaded. Maybe, you know, you've done a lot of therapy. You, you done different modalities in therapy, right? You've done like talk therapy or CBT, EMDR or whatever, um, uh, emotional freedom technique, tapping, you know, um, or you may use energy healing, hypnosis. It kind of doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it, the modality matters, but at the same time, it doesn't matter when it comes to um, the healing and um, repairing childhood issues, um, conditioning. Uh, when it comes to achieving your greatest potential and wanting to be that person and how do you become that person and when it comes to healing your connection patterns and your relationship patterns I'm going to share with you six reasons why therapy hasn't worked and when I say therapy I'm including everything even alternative methods um, from you know working with a PhD person or someone with multiple PhDs to working with someone who uh, specializes in something alternative. I'm including everything and I'm sharing with you why and when it doesn't work and what you have to do to make it work, to start seeing real results. Okay, number one, it doesn't matter what the therapist or the practitioner or whoever whatever they studied or the level of education because sometimes people pick someone because of their PhD. My first couple of therapists shortly after I started therapy, they had PhDs. 
So I know it's not relevant when it comes to does it matter? Does it, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. You know, degree is nice. Um, but there's this other aspect of therapy that when it comes to this kind of work, books and theory alone cannot make you a good therapist. What is required is experience um, as well as how they resolve their stuff because I start to realize more and more how therapists don't they ha they've done the books and they're very studious and if you are really smart you can get um you, you know you can become a psychologist or a psychiatrist or you know you can become obviously a therapist or whatever but if you don't know how to resolve your issues at the human level you don't know how to help someone else so um, one of the things I've noticed more and more, um, especially in my business as well, working with certain types of people who are in the healing um, practice, they don't do their own work or they think they did, but they intellectualize everything and that becomes their protective mechanism around their ego. When I say ego, I mean from more of like a new agey sense, that's their the, the part of them they don't want to acknowledge so they don't resolve their own stuff but they want to fix other people's stuff and when they fix other people's stuff it makes them feel good like you know they're they feel they feel superior I suppose or they they don't need to look at their own stuff so they're fixing other people's stuff without really knowing how to fix the stuff if that makes sense so what ends up happening is that because they have too many blind spots, they don't give you the right advice. Not intentionally, right? They may enable your problem, okay? Um, so for example, a therapist who doesn't recognize signs of toxicity in a relationship that seems like a really nice kind of, your spouse is really nice to other people in front of them and they have like this way of being but then they're super toxic beneath the surface uh, an intellectual therapist may not be able to see that because they're probably tolerating that in their own life so they can't give you the advice that you need um, or be able to you know have they don't have the discerning eye and know how to handle complex situations like this uh, another example is if you know I love I also find that in therapy or in this healing modality in general, the type of people who come into this kind of practice and to study it are either people who have the tendency to be narcissistic. I'm not saying that they're narcissistic, but they, they could be, okay? Because there's a lot of supply of needy people and they just like thrive on that. Uh, it's very toxic. You have to be very careful who your therapist is and you have to understand red flags and signs. <laughs> be careful because I've had narcissistic coaches before. Okay. And it's, it's really, it's <laughs> anyway, it's an experience you don't want to have. It's, it, it, it puts you in a worse situation than where you began. Right. Um, and I've heard of clients having had, or people who have had narcissistic therapists and you know, it's just horrible. Um, the other aspects that they may be codependent and, and, and they just like want to be needed and they want to help people, that's lovely, but it doesn't actually help to solve the problem because they're still tolerating a lot of dependence and that's how they live. So basically what I'm saying is that if people don't know how to solve their issue, like if your therapist has addiction and they're trying to help you fix addiction, like how does this work it's not only about intellectualism when it comes to changing you know whatever conditioning that's led you to have this issue right um so that's the first reason it's kind of convoluted but that's the first reason why it likely hasn't worked for you you just happen to be working with someone who really doesn't understand how to fix it they have the degree they have the intellectual knowledge but they cannot apply it when it comes to a, a person and um, helping that person overcome it because they it's an issue that they themselves don't know how to deal with. So that's first. Second, 
after all of this healing, what I've learned is that trust and connection are the two areas that need to be repaired in order to heal much, like uh, most of, like a huge percentage, okay? I can't even say like 90% or whatever because you know there's no data. I, I cannot make that kind of claim. But if you fix your trust and connection issues, you fix pretty much almost every problem that you are having. Um, trust and connection becomes damaged when it comes to you know experiencing neglect, abandonment, harsh judgment and criticizing. If you don't have that, you don't know how to read people. You don't know how to read people, you don't know what to expect from people, you don't know to, what to expect from relationships. And what ends up happening is that you don't even know how to connect with yourself, if that makes sense. So if you know you have trouble with soft skills um, through work experience and even friendships, if you heal trust and connection, you are basically healing many layers of trauma. You're healing many layers of your life. You're healing parenting issues, uh, marriage and relationship, dating, um, choosing the right person, being able to maintain relationships, not only that, co-worker relationships, uh, relationships that has to do with how you position yourself, you know, as an expert or um, as a professional, and you know the relationship, uh, you know, with promotion. Um, then you're healing your ability to promote, uh, be promoted, or to promote yourself. Um, that fixes the financial issues, and also you know, being fully connected to yourself. You're not gonna really have addiction issues because addiction is a way to feel that emotional hunger you're not gonna be this binge eater or have weight issues um you know um alleviate a lot of the stress that you may be experiencing through your family of origin with siblings with extended families you know with your with your in-laws or you know whatever it is just basically when you heal trust and connection that when you repair that piece that's when you truly, truly have done the work. Or when you're healing that, that's when you're healing. That's when you are doing the work. That's tangible. And even if you have career issues or you don't know your life purpose, you heal that. And it's like, you could almost say like, that's kind of like, you know, um, when you go down into the deep root of something, that's where like you heal that and it's magic, right? Um, this is like pretty much an absolute. I can 100% guarantee that if you focus on healing your connection and trust, you would completely change your life. You, you've you had the abundance, you feel amazing, you have connections, you know, um, you invite the right people in, you know how to choose people, like all of these things changes, you know, including parenting and your legacy, um, you know, workplaces, if you tend to get into toxic cultures, you repair this piece, it changes. Um, I don't know how much more to explain this. Hopefully this makes sense. If you if, if you like me to explain this more, just drop a comment down below so I can explain. I can make another video on this whole topic. Now, when you do therapy, they just want you to talk about something. It's like, tell me about the abuse. Tell me about this. Tell me. But that doesn't do it. It doesn't heal trust and connection. Trust and connection is experiential. If you never had someone that you could trust and connect with, talking about it is not going to fix that. You need to start experiencing trust and connection. What is safe? Uh, what is a real, like, what does real connection feel like? What does trust feel like? Unless you have that kind of experience um, with, your, with, your, with your practitioner, your, your therapist, it's still keeping a professional, but having something that is healthy, until you experience that, you won't change. There's no way to heal trauma without this piece because what a lot of people are missing is the sense of safety and um, learning how to feel safe in your body, in your environment, where you are right now, you know, being present. That can only happen when you experience trust and connection. And if you've never had that, did that supposed to be your parents? But most of you watching this video, your parents were not the ones, they're the ones who who made you feel unsafe and um, they enabled or they perpetrated the pain that you're wanting to heal. So you need to now 
create an experience where you can connect with someone who can help you see these things, who can kind of guide you and hold your hand. And if therapists are clinical and that's what they know and they're like book smart, they have no idea how to do it. And in fact, they're struggling their own trauma behind that fancy degree. So that's why it doesn't work. That's why it hasn't worked for you. Number three has to do with more of your behavior as a person seeking healing. And this was my issue too. So I'm not, when I say you, I'm not putting you in the spot. You only show up when things are bad. So this was my pattern in the past where I would go to therapy. Like in the beginning of the video, I mentioned how I was going to therapy and you may have thought, wow, like, you know, she was really dedicated. But again, time period, but also now looking at the details, I was on and off, on and off. Like when I felt better, I stopped going. Uh, do you find that familiar? Um, maybe you have rationalizations like, oh, I can't afford it. You know, I can't afford to go all the time. So you want to think of it this way. Um, if your roof is leaking and you put a piece of band-aid there, it's now leaking for now, so you don't do anything about it. And then if there's like a torrential rain, right? And I live in Vancouver, so that means, you know, <laughs> half the year we're going to be experiencing rain and a lot of rain because Vancouver is a temperate rainforest. It rains a lot here. So if you live like in England or something, you may be able to relate, right? Somewhere that rains a lot. Um, or in like actual rainforest, if you live in a rainforest, like, you know, I don't know, in like Southeast Asia or like South America. Anyway, off topic. So if you do that, you're always starting over. So this is what I did. Because I, I expect a therapy, like if I go there, that counts. But no, going there is like putting on your gym shoes, but like getting to the gym, but going once. And then you don't go until you get really unhealthy and then you show up again in your, in your gym gear and you get there and you do something, like you do some reps. But that's it. <laughs> You're not going to get results, right? So... What does it need? What does it, what is required is that you need consistency. Just know that your trauma or your long-term childhood wounds or the way you do relationships or whatever pattern you have, like bad money patterns or whatever, that didn't just form in one day. That was consistent experience, repetition of you know, hearing things and being told things and being put in a situation experiencing also generational stuff you know things get embedded at the cellular level <laughs> when you go to therapy or you get help only when you're having extremely bad and then you stop that's that's a habit of someone who is committed to not healing and to many of you you are already going outside of your comfort zone seeking help because in your family that's not something that's done but what you have to understand that to overcome this kind of human conditioning, uh, because trauma is gets passed down through generations. You know, your parents are traumatized and they had bad experiences, they pass it down to you. Overcoming that kind of conditioning is not like a one-time thing and then you're done. It, it, those things do not exist, okay? That's like you committing to never work in your life and only buying the lottery when you need food. Like it, it makes no sense. <laughs> it really makes no sense. You need consistency. What you have to do is you have to show up consistently. You have to be committed and even show up when things are going pretty okay. Because guess what? That's when you do better work. Because now you're not just fighting to get to a level of harmony. Now when you are already in harmony, you can reach more. This is what we call self-responsibility is that no one's going to tell you to do this. No one's going to call you up and be like, hey, you're going to do this. Um, you have to teach yourself to do that. This is being an adult. This is being, this is, if you have big goals, you have to be that person. Otherwise, therapy does not work. Healing doesn't work. It doesn't matter what modality you choose or who you go to, it's not going to work unless you show up consistently. And also self-responsibility is what you do outside of the time, which leads into number four, is when you expect trauma to disappear because you're doing work. This is an expectation issue. Trauma doesn't disappear. Like uh, I've had some people comment like, 
wow, Julia, like, I love that, you know, you had like so much adversity and trauma. And you're like, totally fine now. I said, that's not how this works. You have to set the expect expectation right so you can recognize when you are doing better. So you can see that when you're progressing, you're noticing them. Trauma doesn't get vacuumed out and thrown out and you never ever have to deal with it again. And I think sometimes people sell you that and I don't agree with that. I really do not like these um, new age type of modalities or some special whatever modalities for healing that, that may give the idea that you just suck it out like a vacuum and then you're done, you're like a new person. That doesn't happen with trauma. That doesn't happen with healing. That doesn't happen with becoming a better version of yourself. What does happen is that you can recognize because when you, when you react from trauma, you react so you may be impulsive or you may, you know, have a bad experience with someone like, ah! you know, you yell at the person um, or you just like curl in and you freeze or whatever your coping mechanism has been from childhood. That's when you react and you live in trauma. Um, or, you know, like some people have avoidance and they're just like, pretend like everything's okay, you know, I'm spiritual, everything's fine, you know, and they become like enablers. <laughs> <laughs> another topic uh, however the coping mechanism is when you do your work and when you are doing well in your healing journey you gain the ability to observe these things and realize oh I used to do that like automatically like that um, I used to resist like this like right away or I used to get really triggered by this thing or whatever but now I observe it and it's not like what it's not automatic and then you like shoot and you can't stop yourself. You observe it and you, you can choose differently. So what happens is the trauma stops controlling you. Uh, you can assess it and does this meet the goal or the outcome I want? Is this who I want to be? And like actually having space to think about these things and then choosing something else that's healing it's not that gone and you never have to think about it that is that is not how this works okay um you know i i experienced a lot of abuse does it mean that during sex it never ever ever comes up no it does come up but it's like you know you learn the ability to you know calm your senses calm your nerves you can change your thoughts because when, you, when you're controlled by your trauma, you can't change your thoughts. It feels like you can't. But when you are healed and you're doing the work, the trauma starts to affect you less and less and less. And you can create space between yourself and the trauma's reaction. That's healed. And you choose differently. Um, the other thing that I, I also noticed in my healing journey is that I can put myself in people's shoes better. That's something that I thought I was able to do. Um, you know, some of you are empathic watching this and you may think like, oh, I'm empathic, I understand people. But when you're controlled by trauma, it's really difficult to truly um, think of the other person because where you're coming from is that trauma puts you in this neediness. It's, it's like an emotional neediness. So when you're needy and you're you're not, uh, when you're feeling needy, it's really hard to think of the other person from a balanced place where you're not projecting. So that's the other thing where you recognize that, wow, you know, this healing is working. You know, you, like the trauma is no longer controlling me so much. Um, and also you see evidence in how you choose people. It's just, you know, things go a lot smoother in your life. You make good decisions, right? You make decisions even though maybe people not, everyone agrees with it. You do it and it's the right thing for yourself. You can choose yourself um, and m making sure that your needs are met, even though there are other people involved that they may not like it. So in these aspects, that's when you see that you are healing or that you've healed. Number five is self-responsibility. I remember back when, when I was wanting therapy to work and not working and going there a lot, I wasn't aware that I wasn't taking self-responsibility and ownership. Meaning, 
I expected the time with the therapist to fix everything for me. So if you go to energy healing, maybe you expect that session to like, you know, completely, you know, rinse out your brain and then you're going to be fine. Or like cleanse you out of the cellular level and then you're going to, it's not like that. What is self-responsibility? The real work begins when you leave the session. The real work begins when you go back into your regular life and what you do. Did you choose differently? Are you observing your thoughts? Are you uh, practicing the methods or the modalities um, or to practicing the new habits that you, that's going to help you? Uh, even the smallest thing, like, uh, you no, know, my therapist told me to do meditation and he literally took me three years to get started. Three years. <laughs> and my reason is that I'm not that kind of person. I have too much energy. I can't sit. I mean, now we have to look at the behavior, right? And the desire is I want to heal. And the behavior is saying, no, thank you. I'm going to keep my life. So you have to ask yourself, how much are you doing that? Are you getting sessions but not changing anything else? Like, are you, you know, if your hypnotherapist gives you a recording and you don't listen to it, or your hip, or your your therapist or your coach gives you tangible action steps and you don't do it, then that's lacking self-responsibility. Therapy or changing your life is not only about feeling good at the moment with somebody supportive. It's about how you show up, you know, as an adult. How are you going to take on the responsibility to start creating those changes outside of the session? That's when the real work begins and to keep that consistent. Sixth reason, healing cannot take place at the logical, conscious, intellectual level. When we're talking about this kind of you know, trauma with this connection, abandonment, attachment issues, um, disconnection, severe trauma like sexual trauma, violence, you know, alcoholism in your family or addictions in your family. This kind of thing does not heal because you know something. It does not work like that. It really, really doesn't. And I see too many people who do their best uh, based on what they know and then they go and study something or they go read a book or something like that. Um, or even have therapists who will just like talk them into stuff and it doesn't work. You have to change your emotional memory, emotional experiences. That is not logical. As soon as your logic takes over, you are no longer accessing the part that you need to access to transform, to heal. The healing part happens at the intangible level. Intangible meaning emotion. We cannot quantify it, right? There's emotional brain. It was like separate from the logical brain. That's why when your conscious activates, your subconscious it subsides, it quiets down. And then when your subconscious activates, your, your conscious quiets down. It's just the way the brain works. If you keep trying to work with the logical brain, with knowledge, with theory, you go and studying something, you're getting a PhD, like I feel like a lot of therapists went down the path and, and that's how they became therapists. You're like, oh, I really li love this work. I want to you know, heal more. So you go and study something. It doesn't work. It really doesn't work. You, you can know a lot of things. You can memorize books, but healing is a totally different thing. What needs to happen is to retrain your senses. That, that, uh, that's addressing triggers, that's you know, looking at your triggers, is about quieting your senses, and by no means I consider myself like the best expert in this, um, but what, what I do know is, is the areas that you need to look at, and talking about it more can re-traumatize you. It's not good, okay? Uh, especially if you have severe trauma like I have, I've had. Talking about it a lot is not good for you. Um, if you had really, you know, and when I say severe trauma, I don't mean that you've had to have something really, really bad, but you know, being separated from your mother, like that's severe trauma. You know, I've worked with some clients who were adopted at a very early age or parents died or something like that. Both parents passed away. That's, you know, that's severe trauma. Even though things went sort of well afterwards, that's still quite a severe, <laughs> that's very severe trauma. Um, what about if, um, if you're adopted and you know you lived the first two years of your life in a war zone? That's 
you cannot access that by talking to someone about it. Some of our biggest pains are emotional memories. They're in the sensory system that is automatic. It's like your nervous system activating, um, wanting to protect you, right? Triggers, uh, impulsiveness, you know, uh, these are all symptoms, right? Um, you know, falling into people pleasing or being really angry all the time, um, you know, having mood swings. These are all symptoms of unresolved trauma. And by no means, I'm saying I am better than someone with a PhD. But what I am saying is that, you know, on my healing journey, the more I talked about it, the worse it got. The more I focused on calming my senses and calming my, uh, my nerves and retraining my senses, retraining myself to experience life differently, that's what, that's what ended up taking me on the healing journey. You know, I'm not saying all therapy is bad because I had one particular therapist that was extremely good for me. And basically the reason why she was so good for me is because she hit all most of those points I was telling you about. She's the one who told me to meditate that I didn't listen to for like three years. Okay. Um, and I was also experimenting with different modalities, you know, always, you know, very like conscious, logically driven, very goal getter. You know, that's, that was my coping mechanism. Um, so if you're a goal getter type of person, that's also a coping mechanism of trauma activation. When you tend to go into that, become very single minded. I, that awareness came from working with this particular therapist. Um, and that's how you know when someone is really good at what they do and someone is book smart. You definitely do not want to go with someone who is book smart. Some of the things I want to remind you before I close this off, kind of a longish video. So thank you for watching. What I want to say is that um, what feels like reality to you is sabotaging you. So, you know, intellectualism is often a coping mechanism to feel safer. Um, you know, needing a lot of proof or science backed up. That's also very much, you know, that's a coping mechanism of needing certainty and safety that you didn't have emotionally. Um, the other thing is resistance, argumentativeness. These are all symptoms of unresolved trauma. In some ways, you could see these symptoms as, hey, that's like, those are good qualities because you're being discerning of you know, data and whatnot. But that overthinking is a trauma response, is an unresolved trauma response. What I can tell you, if you really do want to heal, if you really want a better life, if you do really want to change your patterning, you have to understand that the brain that got you to where you are right now is not going to help you get somewhere else. If you only do what's realistic for you and what sounds right to you right now, you're going in circles and that's how I experienced too. I was, I thought I was open-minded in my earlier days of healing. I thought I was open-minded, but when I truly look back, I wasn't that open-minded. I was making decisions based on who I was rather than who I wanted to become. You must be willing to try things that are outside of your comfort zone. You must be open to ideas that are outside of your paradigm. Unless you do so, you keep circling in the same. And just remember that when you repair your connection and your relationship patterns, trust, being healthily vulnerable, that's when your life will start to change. If you like to do this work with me as a coach, I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach, to heal your sensory system, to take this other approach of creating abundance, repairing sense of connection and trust. If you like to do that work with me, with someone who's lived through something severe and um, I work with clients and clients get amazing results. It's not like, you know, I just showed up one day and decided I'm going to put, you know, <laughs> ask me to work with me. No, I've been on a long journey and I do have training and I did not go the, the typical route. Um, I have my program called Rich and Loved, particularly for professionals, high achievers who want to have both wealth and love and to free yourself into uh, your greatest potential, your what I call the freedom frequency. Go to the description box and you'll find my calendar link there for a free consultation to see 
if we're fit to do this work together. Uh, it's a smallish group that we do this work together and um, the next cohort is starting very soon. Just go down to the description. We can meet to see if this is the right work for you to really change your mental programming and to achieve your greatest potential. Thank you so much for being here and for listening in. Um, I'm curious if you ended up watching the whole video because this is the longest video I've ever made um, with my story, a bit more of my story. And I would love to know what else would you like to see next? Drop some comments down below. I would love to know. And I truly believe in your ability to heal, elevate and become your greatest self, your true potential, live as a true self and command and create success on your terms. It's Julia Cha. Thanks for watching and see you in my next video.